हेलो फ्रेंड्स आई एम अदिति वेलकम टू माई चैनल लाइब्रेरी माउस टूडे आई एम गोइंग टू रीड अ बुक हाउ टू डेवलप सेल्फ कॉन्फिडेंस एंड इन्फ्लुएंस पीपल बाई पब्लिक स्पीकिंग बाई डेल कानिगी दिस बुक कंटेन टूल्स चैप्टर्स लेट स्टार्ट विद चैप्टर थ्री हाउ फेमस स्पीकर्स प्रिपेयर देयर एड्रेसेस आई वॉज प्रेजेंट वंस एट अ लंचन ऑफ द न्यू यॉर्क रोटरी क्लब when the principal speaker was a prominent government official the high position that he occupied gave him prestige and we were looking forward with pleasure to hearing him he had promised to tell us about the activities of his own department and it was one in which almost every new york businessman was interested he knew his subject thoroughly knew far more about it than he could possibly use but he had not planned his speech he had not selected his material he had not arranged it in orderly fashion nevertheless with a courage born of inexperience he plunged headlessly blindly into his speech he did not know where he was going but he as on his way his mind was in short a mere hodgepodge and so was the mental feast he served us he brought on the ice cream first and then placed the soup before us fish and nuts came next and on top of that there was something that seemed to be a mixture of soup and ice cream and good red herring have never anywhere or at any time seen a speaker more utterly confused he had been trying to talk impromptu but in dispersion now he drew a bundle of notes out of his pocket confessing that his secretary had compiled them for him and no one questioned the veracity of his assertion the notes themselves evidently had no more ado than a fracture full of scarp iron he fumbled through them nervously glancing from one page to another trying to orient himself trying to find a way out of the wilderness and he attempted to talk as he did so it was impossible he apologized and calling for water took a drink with a trembling hand uttered a few more scattering sentences repeated himself dug into his notes again minute by minute he grew more helpless more lost more bewildered more embarrassed nervous perspiration stood out on his forehead and his handkerchief shook as he wiped it away we in the audience sat watching the fiasco our impasses straight our feelings harrowed we suffered positive and vigorous embarrassment but with more doggedness than discretion the speaker continued floundering studying his notes apologizing and drinking everyone expect him felt that the spectacle was rapidly approaching total disaster and it was a relief to us all when he sat down and ceased his death struggle it was one of the most ashamed and humiliated speaker i have ever seen He had made his talk as Rossio said a love letter should be written. He had begun without knowing what he was going to say and he had finished without knowing what he had uttered. The moral of the tale is just this: when a man's knowledge is not in order, said Harvard Spencer, the more of it he has, the greater will be his confession of thought. No sane man would start to build a house without some sort of plan. but why wilt he begin to deliver a speech without the vaguest kind of outline or program a speech is a wake with a purpose and it must be chattered the person who starts now here generally gets there i wish that i could paint the saying of napoleon's in flaming letter of red a foot high over every doorway on the globe where student of public speaking for gather the art of war is a science in which nothing succeed which has not been calculated and thought out that is just as true of speaking as of shooting but do speakers realize it or if they do do they always act on it they do not most empathetically they do not many a talk lasts just a trifle more plan and arrangement than a bowl of fish stew What is the best and most effective arrangement for a given set of ideas no one say until he has studied them it is always a new problem an internal question that every speaker must ask and answer again and again no infallible rules can be given but we can at any rate illustrate briefly here 
with a concrete case just what we mean by orderly arrangements how a prize winning speech was constructed here is a speech that was delivered some years ago before the national association of real estate boards it won first prize in competition with 27 other speeches on various cities and would do so today this speech is well constructed full of facts stated clearly vividly interestingly in has spirit marches it will merit reading and study mr chairman and friends back 144 years ago this great nation the united states of america was born in my city of philadelphia and so it is quite natural that a city having such an historical record should have that strong american spirit that has not only made it the greatest industrial center in this country but also one of the largest and most beautiful cities in the whole world philadelphia has a population close to 2 millions of people and our city has an area that is equal to the combined size of milwaukee and boston paris arid berlin and out of our 130 square miles of territory we have given up nearly 8000 acres of our best land for beautiful parks squares and boulevards so that our people would have the proper place for recreation and pleasure and the right kind of environment that belongs to every decent american philadelphia friends is not only a large clean and beautiful city but it is also known everywhere as the great workshop of the world and the reason it is called the workshop of the world is because we have a vast army of over 4 lakh people employed in 9200 industrial establishments that turn out 100000 dollars worth of useful commodities every 10 minutes of the working day and according to a well known statistician there is no city in this country that equals philadelphia in the production of woolen goods leather goods night goods textiles felt hats hardware tools storage batteries steel ships and a great many other things we build a railroad locomotive every 2 hours day and night and more than one half the people in this great country ride in street cars made in the city of philadelphia we manufacture a thousand cigars every minute and last year in our 150 hosiery meals we made two pairs of stockings for every man woman and child in this country we make more carpets and mugs than l of great britain and ireland combined and in fact our total commercial and industrial business is so stupendous that our bank clearings last year amounting to 37 billions of dollars would have paid for every liberty bond in the entire country but friends while we were very proud of our wonderful industrial progress and while we were also very proud of being one of the largest medical art and educational centers in this country yet we feel a still greater pride in the fact that we have more individual homes in the city of philadelphia than there are in any other city in the whole world in philadelphia we have 397000 separate homes and if these homes were placed on 25 foot lots side by side in one single row that row would reach all the way from philadelphia clear through to this convection hall at kansas city and then to denver a distance of 1881 miles but what i want to call your special attention to is the significance of the fact that tens of thousands of these homes are owned and occupied by the working people of our city and when a man owns the ground upon which he stands and the roof over his head there is no argument ever presented that would infect that man with those imported diseases known as socialism and bolshevism philadelphia is not a fertile soil for european anarchy because our homes our educational institution and our genetic industry have been produced by that true american spirit that was born in our city and is a heritage from our forefathers philadelphia is the mother city of this great country and the very fountain head of american liberty it is the city where the first american flag was made it is the city where the first congress of the united states met 
It is the city where the Declaration of Independence was signed. It is the city where the best loved relic in the America, the Liberty Bell, has inspired tens of the thousands of our men, women and children so that we believed we have a scared mission which is not to worship the golden calf but to spread the American spirit and to keep the fires of freedom burning so that with God's permission the government of Washington, Lincoln and Theodore Roosevelt may be an inspiration to all humanity. Let us analyze that speech. Let us see how it constructed, how it gets its effect. In the first place, it has a beginning and an ending. That is the real virtue, more rare than you may be inclined to think. It starts somewhere, it dees this straight as wild geese on the wing, it doesn't dawdle, it loses no time, it has freshness, individuality. The speaker opens by speaking something about his city that the other speaker should not possibly say about thrice. He points out that his city is la birthplace of the entire nation. He states that it is the one of the largest and most beautiful cities in the world. But that claim is general, tried standing by itself, it would not impress anyone very much. The weaker knew that, so he helped his audience visualize the magnitude of Philadelphia by stating it has an area equal to the combined size of Milwaukee, Boston, Paris and Berlin that is definite concrete. It is interesting. It is surprising. It makes a mark. It drives home the idea better than a whole page of statistics would have done. Next, he declares the Philadelphia is known everywhere as the great workshop of the world. Sounds exaggerated, doesn't it? Like propaganda. Had he produced immediately to the next point, no one would have been convinced. But he doesn't. He paused to enumerate the products in which Philadelphia leads the world. Woolen goods, leather goods, night goods, textiles, foil hats, hardware, tools, storage batteries, steel ships. Doesn't sound so much like propaganda now, does it? Philadelphia builds a railroad locomotive every two hours a day and night and more than one half the people in this great country ride in streetcars made in the city of Philadelphia. Well, I knew that. We muse. Perhaps I rode down towns yesterday in one of those streetcars. I'll look tomorrow and see where my town buys its cars. A thousand cigars every minute, two pairs of stockings for every man, woman and child in this country. We are still more impressed. Maybe my favorite cigar is made in Philadelphia and these socks I have on. What does the speaker do next? Jump back to the subject of the size of Philadelphia that he covered first and give us some fact that he forgot then. No, not at all. He sticks to a point until he finishes it, has done with it and need never return to it again. For that, we are duly grateful, Mr. Speaker, for what is more confusing and muddling than to have a speaker darting from one thing to another and back again as erratic as a bat in the twilight. Yet many a speaker does that. Instead of covering his points in order 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, he covers them as a football captain calls out signals 27, 34, 19, 2. No, he is worse than that. He covers them like this, 27, 34, 27, 19, 2, 34, 19. But the speaker, however, steams straight ahead on scheduled time, never idling, never turning back, swearing neither to the right nor left, like one of those locomotives he has been talking about. But he makes now the weakest point of his entire speech. Philadelphia, he declares, is one of the largest medical art and educational centers in this country. He merely announced that, then speeds on to something else, only 12 words to animate the fact, to make it pivot, to engrave it on the memory, only 12 words lost, submerged in a sentence containing a total of 65. It doesn't work, of course not. The human mind does not operate like a string of thrill trips. He devotes so little time to this point, is so general, so ways, seems so unimpressed himself that the fact on the hearer is almost null. What should we have done? He realized that he should establish his point with the self-same technique that he just employed to establish the fact that Philadelphia is the workshop of the world. He knew that. He also knew that he would have to stop watch held on him during the contest, that he would have five minutes 
not a second more so he had to slur over this points to or slight others there are more individuals homes in this city of philadelphia than there are in any other city in the world how does he makes this phrase of this topic impressive and convincing first he gives the number 397000 second he visualized the number if these homes were placed on 25 foot lots side by side in one single row that row would reach all the way from philadelphia clear through this convection hall at kansas city and then on to denver a distance of 1881 miles his audience probably forgot the number he gave before lee had finished the sentence but forgot that picture that would have been well nigh impossible so much for cold material facts but they are not the stuff out of which eloquence is fashioned the speaker aspired to build up to a climax to touch the heart to stir the feelings so now on the home stretch he deals with emotional material he tells what the ownership of those homes means to the spirit of the city he denounces those imported diseases known as socialism and bolshevism he eulogizes philadelphia as the very fortunate of american liberty liberty a magical word a word full of feeling a sentiment for which millions have let down their lives that phrases in itself is good but it is a thousand times better when he backs it up with concrete reference to historic events and documents dear scored to the hearts of his hearers it is the city where the first american flag was made it is the city where the first congress of the united states met it is the city where the declaration of independence was signed liberty bell a scared mission to spread the american spirit to keep the fears of freedom burning so that with god's permission the government of washington lincoln and the theodore roosevelt may be an inspiration to all humanity that is the real climax so much for the composition of the stock but admirable as it is from the standpoint of construction this speech could come to grief could see easily have been brought to naught had it been expressed in a calm manner devoid of all spirit and vitality but the speaker delivered it as he composed it with a feeling and enthusiasm born of the deepest sincerity small wonder that it won first prize that it was awarded the chicago cup in next video we will continue this thank you so much for listening it and i hope it is understandable to you if you enjoy watching my videos do like subscribe and share with your family and friends thank you